Welcome back, friends. You're just in time for the Johnny Blue Show. What's going on, everybody? This is John Brookhagen, host of the Johnny Brew Show, and welcome to another special edition with a special interview with another amazing young woman. We had um, Alita Benson on last week, and the um, impressive young ladies continue to roll through. Aren't I a lucky guy? Today, it's going to be Danielle Ford. She's the Clark County Board of Trustees for District F, which is kind of... Um, the southwest side of Vegas, it's Spring Valley, Durango, uh, Southwest Technical, and then even further southwest than that when you get into some of the more rural parts of Nevada. So we're going to be talking about everything from her growing up, she went to CCSD, um, to her getting pregnant at an early age and starting a family. She um, had a couple of businesses and did a lot of things in order to empower young women. And then, obviously, she got into politics. We're going to talk about her um, decision to get into politics, how it's been ever since then, what's going on since she's become a trustee. And then, finally, of course, there's a lot of current events that we're going to have to talk about, from CRT and anti-racist uh, policy to the new grading schedule, masks in school, coronavirus, distance learning. I mean, there's just so much to cover that we're going to have to really get going. I'm going to do my best to keep it moving while still covering everything. Speaking of education, anytime you need any help for your children in school, you got to look up Infinity, the Math Institute, um, where you don't get more math problems, you get solutions. That's the mathinstitute.com. Give them a call at 702-768-1777. And also, what I really need from you guys is I need you guys to subscribe that's the singular thing I ask from you is please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And without further ado, may I introduce you to Danielle Ford. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. And I will just say that uh, the Math Institute is awesome as I have uh, experience in it and the kids love it here. So. And, you know, that's a great point. You know, I met you. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how we met, but I know it was right about the time that you were either running for trustee or you had just become trustee. I, think I was elected then and you had like a lot of questions. I was like, I have the same questions. Let's talk about it. Good. <laughs> right, right. We were talking about budgets and stuff yeah. like that. And... Um, and then also you came down, you were one of our celebrity poker dealers on a Friday fun night, <laughs> and we had a blast, and yep. your picture, I forgot, I should have shown you. I saw it. I was you saw your picture around, on the like, walls? Oh, there's me. <laughs> there you are. So you're everywhere. And to be honest, guys, go ahead and Google her name. She is everywhere. <laughs> so let's get started. First of all, you grew up here in Las Vegas. I was born and raised here in Las Vegas. It's, I went to CCSD. I went to eight different schools oh. here in CCSD. I had somewhat of a chaotic childhood um, and often had to move in the middle of the night. You know, really? and become a... You mean chaotic, like your parents didn't get along or... My parents divorced when I was little, like two weeks old. Oh. Uh, so I come from a split home and then, you know, that's a whole other story. But it did lead, lead to a lot of like being the new kid all the time, starting school in the middle of the year. I've gone to schools in all five different districts, not the one that I'm trustee of. Really? <laughs> but many other districts, uh, many schools. And uh, I, I, you know, I fe already felt like I had a really solid understanding of the school district, uh, broad understanding. Uh, and then when I became a young mom, my kids also entered CCSD. And so then I kind of, you know, Don't got get too second. far ahead. Jeez. Oh, well, Jeez. I, was gonna have a, to say, I thought I was afraid this is going to be a five-hour interview. If I let her keep going, it's going to be a five-minute interview. I have like 30 years experience with the district. All right. And, right <laughs> and uh, like, for example, which middle school did you go to the most at CCSD? I went, actually, I went to a private school for a beginning of sixth grade. Then is I the went one that's to, still here? Um, it changed into Lake Mead. It used to be called okay. Paradise. And then I went to uh, Cannon. All and right. then I went to Brinley. Brinley. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. And that's so just middle schools. Middle schools yeah. And that's only two or three years. Yeah. All right. And then what high school did you attend? I went to Cimarron. Or high schools. Only Cimarron. Really? Mm -hmm. And how did that go? What was that experience? Like? I, I mean, I love school. I was, um, I always did good, had good grades. Right. You know, always. Extracurriculars. Theater. Uh, 
little bit of, you know, dance or whatever, but mostly theater was my jam. And honestly, theater is the reason why I probably stayed in school as long as I did. It would encouraged you and you loved it, so you had to go yeah, to school. Yeah, but I used to work since I was 14, and I would actually walk from high school, from Cimarron, to my job. Which was? It was actually a school uniform place for private school kids. So I would go there and help um, private school kids like get their uniforms. Like in textiles, like sewing and making? No, like... Um, like, oh, they go to this school and here's the types of uh, shirts that has to be this material or this size and let's get them sized and khaki or do you want navy, navy pants? You were you doing know? sales. Sales and like a warehouse stuff. So just like hustling, just like yeah, hustling. Yeah. Wow. And then I used to, you know, I've had a bunch of different jobs, but I had to work, you know, ended up getting a car, got a better job I could drive to. And at the end of the day, I prioritized work over school. Uh, especially because I already passed my, profici my proficiencies when I was a sophomore when we had proficiencies. Um, I had PE, like, first subject, to the point where I'd be like, why am I going to go to PE, get all sweaty, have to go to work right after? So I would just be like, I'm just going to not go to PE. And then by the time I got to my junior year, um, my, I was actually advised by my counselor that I should, I could drop out, go get my GED. Or you were gonna have to take like four or I was of gonna PE do PE. to make up the stuff. Yeah, and so I was like, I just wanna go to beauty school anyway. Um, <laughs> they wanted you to go to 13th grade and take five PE absolutely. classes. Absolutely, <laughs> and I was like, that's not gonna happen. So I got my GED like the next week, and I actually graduated with a trade from, um, with an aesthetics uh, certification the same month that my friends got their diploma. So oh, I was, so, so you had graduated and got in a trade school diploma in the same month. time that they were actually and going through all that. same month that I popped out my daughter. Oh, <laughs> so a lot of things so, happened. So when the month you were supposed to graduate, you yeah. actually gave birth. My would-be senior year, I was pregnant and doing uh, <clears throat> trade school. And yes, definitely. I, so I you've been going I, like this since yeah, you were 14. I'm just like going, going, going. And this is what I do, I don't stop, and I'm very curious. You know, I struggled in school, like I even have a lot of tra traumatizing flashbacks of like going to the wrong class. Things like that, like uh, we have Because you burn schedule. the candle at both ends and you don't know if you're coming or going? Because I have ADHD, <laughs> and I didn't know that at the time. So I went undiagnosed ADHD, well, even though I was a gate student, even though I was an honor student, even though I was like, I could just read something and absorb it, pass the test, you know? Um, I wouldn't do the homework if I already knew it type thing. And so um, now, you know, after being diagnosed at, at 30 years old, uh, I, I went, you know, looked back at my high school experience, middle school, even and elementary. And it answered a lot of questions. Yeah. And I was like, that, that diagnosis is really why I decided to run for the school board. Now, I don't want to uh, belittle your plight or make less of a true condition, but I mean, I think everybody's got some ADHD. It's I mean, I definitely do, especially uh -huh. children and stuff yep. like that. But when you're saying you have ADHD, like I said, you're not just um, a kid shaking your leg like me. I don't know how many of my viewers notice, but my leg is always my going. My chair's spinning the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but you're saying like if it was a measured on a spectrum, you would be almost clinical, whereas I might be like weird. It's like saying everybody has height. Okay, well, if you are four feet tall, you have height. Right. But if you're six feet tall with a lot of height versus seven feet tall, it's still a big difference. Right. And one person's going to be struggling and hitting their head and not realizing why it's so hard for them to get under a door or into a car. And the other person's like, whatever, I have height too. Like it's a Gotcha. It's so a I got a little more height than you, but you got a little more ADHD than me. Exactly. Probably. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. And then, I mean, one of the most significant parts of you going to high school and everything is, of course, you got pregnant at 17, right? I was going to ask you to tell the story, but I don't know how much you guys know about Danielle Ford, but she's opened a number of businesses. I'm guessing six or seven at least, like... Probably Shots like in the dark, a couple that took, maybe, a couple yeah. that mm -hmm. didn't. Say that. And also, before TED Talks was a global phenomenon, you did one of the original TED Talks for them. And to be honest, I'm looking for some quick bites and quick video clips. And next thing you know, you got me sucked into an hour-long TED Talk. because it, <laughs> it was really, really interesting. And it's amazing that that was 10 years ago or 9 yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, rather than hearing it from her live... Why don't we hear Danielle Ford talk about um, what it was like having a kid when she was 17 years old and still a high school student. Good to go? Play tape.
<laughs> when I was 17, I was working at a tanning salon. I had just ordered a port of sub sandwich with extra pickles, and a couple bites into it, I suddenly felt really sick to my stomach, so I rushed to the bathroom and I threw up everywhere. I came back out and I was kind of going, well, that was weird. And my friend and coworker, Jenna, she immediately jumps up and she goes, you're pregnant. I know you're pregnant. I'm going to go buy you a test. And before I even had a chance to be like, dude, I'm not pregnant, she was out the door. Those couple minutes when she was gone were horrifying for me. That started flooding in my mind, like, am I pregnant? I can't be pregnant. What would I do? Would I keep it? I couldn't keep it. I'm only 17. Jenna came back, and I took the test from her, and I played it really cool, and I was kind of like, all right, let me show you how dumb you are. So I started making my way to the bathroom, and my, I was so nervous. My hands were shaking, and I even dropped the test on the floor. So I picked it back up, and I went in the bathroom. I did my thing. I peed on a stick. And <laughs> I came back out, and we waited. We waited, and finally, after a couple minutes, we looked at the stick, and there, clear as day, two blue lines. So the first thing that I did was I picked up the phone, and I called the 800 number on the box, and I asked, OK, so what happens if you take a test, and it says that you're pregnant, but you had just dropped the test like five minutes before, it could be broken, right? <laughs> there was a pause on the line, and then I heard a man's voice tell me, no, ma'am, you are probably pregnant. And that's when reality hit me. In the 2.5 seconds that it took some strange man on the phone to confirm my pregnancy, my life completely changed. I was no longer this Danny, the carefree teenager who wanted to go to beauty school and business school and open a fabulous hair salon. I was now Danielle, one of those girls. You know, and like I said, first of all, guys, just type in Danielle Ford TED Talk and you'll get to see the uh, rest of that. Like I said, I was not looking to watch an hour-long video, but it was so... It's like 13 minutes. Oh. <laughs> just so you know. But I, I watched the whole thing. Okay. Maybe I paused it a couple times because I was okay. working. <laughs> <clears throat> but nonetheless, you talked a lot about being those girls. You talked about becoming a statistic, talking about how, um, you know, girls who get pregnant at 17 tend to get married at 18, tend to have another kid at 19, tend to be divorced at 21, and... Uh, and lo and behold, you said, you know, you kind of did exactly that. And you feel like almost maybe in hindsight more so than at the time, realizing that maybe you did that because that's what was expected of you. And that was kind of like the path you just took. You want to tell us a little bit more about it? I mean, you just said it exactly like I said it. So you're, I did you watch. should be giving a TED Talk, obviously, because <laughs> you could I'm do being it. A teenage mom. <laughs> or something, but <laughs> you killed it. Um, yeah, it really felt like every, everybody else has the plan for you. Oh, you're pregnant and you're with, I mean, I was with my boyfriend for years at that point. So it's like, oh, you're obviously going to get married, obviously. Right. You know, and then he was like, I don't know what to do. He was two years older than me. We were in high school sweethearts. He joined the military. Um, he immediately got sent to basic training. Uh, he got sent to Iraq. And what year was this? 2004. Ish. All right. Yeah, I had my daughter in 2004. And so then he, I became a military wife. And uh, he came back on R&R uh, &R nine months into his tour, got me pregnant with my second kid. <laughs> then a couple of months before he was due back from, you know, actually in Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, where we were stationed, I moved there to get uh, to get to the base before anyone else did to get a good house. Right. So I moved uh, pregnant with my son, uh, eight months pregnant with my one-year-old daughter uh, to tell. Colorado, got a house on the base, got it all ready, and he came home a different person. Really? And do you attribute that to the military or being exposed, or do you attribute it to maybe him being like, what the hell am I doing? I don't want to be married with a kid. I'm 22, or... I oh mean, no! Not it wasn't the it wasn't the latter. He was very devoted um, boyfriend, husband, father. He was young. We were both young, so right. obviously we had like a normal teenage, you know, young twenties right, drama. Downs. But uh, he came back with a drinking problem. 
He came back and was physical, physically violent with me, never was before, cheating on me, um, to the point where we were living on the post and I would call the military police on him, to the point where he would like be drunk and I couldn't get him out of the house to where he'd hide my keys, corner me, was choking me one time, and they would just sweep it under the rug. And so, you know, and I have a lot of respect for our military, especially seeing like the lives they lead. I don't know what would attribute it to it, but I know that- It sounds like alcohol to me. I think that, you know, he was, he was a cook, but of course, when you go to Iraq, it's traumatizing and stressful. Right, and you're doing a lot it's of a work, different life. Even if right. you're not infantry. Right. So it could be a, you know, a lot of different things. When, when, then I ended up leaving him, packed up my kids in the middle of the night, came back to Vegas at 21 and uh, filed for divorce. And then uh, when he, he got dishonorably discharged for drunk driving, Maybe just alcohol, all this different yeah. stuff, uh, then he came back and started using meth. And now I don't know if it was a progression. I don't know if he has schizophrenia that w was just showing itself in his young 20s. Right. Like, I have no idea, but I don't know where he's at now. You don't even know where he is now. He's homeless on the streets. Like it's, I mean, and I've had, I filed for divorce, acted as my own attorney against him with a lawyer, got full custody of the kids uh, when they were two and three. So I, and he doesn't pay child support. Like I've been doing it as a single mom the whole time. And then it was actually out of desperation. My kids got a little bit older. Uh, I had my beauty license here. Right, right. So I could come back. When I came back, I could work as an esthetician. Built my clientele. What did you do? Nails, hair, anything in particular? Uh, facials and makeup waxing and, and waxing. not really makeup, but most skincare. So then I built a clientele, opened my own studio. That's when, that was 2009. And, uh, did you have a spot like in a strip mm -hmm. mall? Oh. Well, yeah, it was like a little, I had employees. I was like learning how to franchise. I wanted to franchise it. Um, but that, you know, I was again single mom. I had kids in elementary school and I would get the call like, hey, your son threw up on your daughter. And I'd be like, <laughs> guess I got to go pick him up and right. who's going to do the clients and train the employees, you know? So it was actually out of necessity for me to close that down or it was, right. you know, but I had built that up by social media and videos. And this is the early 2010s. Yeah. And I was doing YouTube and I was doing great on YouTube and I was building a following. What were you doing on YouTube? Like as to showing, videos? yeah, showing how to wax, showing what a vitamin C facial is, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, having my employees do how-to videos. Uh, and I built quite a following. And then that was when I was like, okay, I get this stuff. Nobody was even really watching YouTube. That was really right. early. Right. And so I thought, I don't know what I, I want to do, but I know I want to make a difference. And now in hindsight, I think I have things to share around being a teen mom. Right. So I'm going to start an organization called Young Moms Club. All right. So then, so you aesthetician, brought the aesthetician to the YouTube, found that you could garner an audience yep. using YouTube and you thought I could probably do something more um, constructive than and be able to work from home C peels. yeah exactly and I don't want to really do this all day I did want to franchise out and like learn how to expand right. and things but um, I was like you know what let me go learn everything I can about internet marketing so I learned how to build websites I learned how to do Photoshop how to do video editing uh, started spokes modeling um, started doing like Paid. Uh, I was on a PT's commercial. Should have sent you those clips. I was. No, on I, th I think I've seen it <laughs> once before. A bunch of and some national campaigns. Uh, some, you know, spokesmodeling for some different like tech companies and green companies coming out. And then I was like learning. Okay, they're paying me to do this. I could do this for myself. Right. Instead of making ninety dollars <laughs> yeah. for an appearance, you can get nine hundred dollars for the advertising campaign. Exactly. Uh, I so. think uh, when you speak about doing the uh, teen mom stuff, and you, I mean, right away, it sounds like you're trying to, you know, contribute to society. You have a talent for speaking, which I'm sure you knew from your theater days, mm -hmm. and then now you have a talent for the internet. You're going to try to help teen moms get through what you went through with some of the advice that you were hoping that you wish you had had at the, the time. The things that they don't, they teach you how to, you know, uh, do a diaper, how to, what formula to use, if you should breastfeed. No one taught me financial literacy, self-care, law of attraction, goal setting, visualization, like none of that, relationship stuff. Well, we have an intro. I mean, I think this was one of your first videos when you launched it. And um, again, guys, all you got to do is go to YouTube or Google if you want to see more of it. But here's a little taste of a young... 23-year-old Danielle About Ford that, yeah. trying to help <laughs> young moms who are only like five years younger than she is at the time. Play tape. Moms Club. If you're a young mom like myself, 
then I'm willing to bet that you're probably experiencing quite a few challenges. Have you ever felt that sense of disappointment from people, your family, your friends, even complete strangers, when they find out that you're a young mom? You know that obvious feeling that that person is just standing there judging you. Even if their intentions are good, you know that they are just thinking like, oh, you poor thing, you just ruined your whole life. You know, I mean, <clears throat> that's real, though. I mean, for real. I mean, for real. even, you know, I work with kids all the time. If uh, one of my 16-year-old girls came in and said, oh, I got pregnant, I, of course, wouldn't say that, but I'd be thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, what did you do? Yeah. You know, and maybe I'm not hiding it as much as I think I am. You know what I mean? She's telling her I'm trying to keep a straight face, but she could probably see the disappointment. He's disappointed, yeah. And so... You know, how was that for you and how was it fulfilling helping others and did people reach out to you? I mean, tell me a little bit about it. Well, my most of my family is really conservative. And so it was, again, you should get married, you know, and then even when I got divorced and, you know, go on my own, it's always like, oh, she's a single mom. Oh, she's struggling. And I was struggling. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, even when I left my husband, I didn't have he cut my cut up my credit cards, you know, and when I finally got an apartment, I slept on the floor for six months, you know, because I, my kids have beds. But I was like, right. I have other things Them to pay first. for. Yeah. And, you know, even there's so many things wrong with our system. When I was making enough money as an esthetician to pay my bills, pay for my car payment, insurance, you know, at a basic level, couldn't pay for, you know, child care. I applied for child care and they were like, you make too much money. I'm like, OK, what am I what do you want me to do? Like, right. <laughs> not Quit work. Job. Yeah. So that's that's another reason why I got into like modeling and making extra money and whatnot, bartending. And when I was in Colorado, actually, I didn't I wasn't. Um, certified or licensed to do aesthetics I went to mixology school when I was at Fort Carson so I also had a like a bartending license <laughs> you know, and I was talking to somebody else about the interview today and we said you know we've all been a bartender at one point right or another especially <laughs> right, people yeah. who have a personality and so so on and so forth so so you followed the AOC school of politics I don't know about that <laughs> but I mean I trust me I'm not going to criticize bartenders and if like I don't know. It's very hard to do. Right, <laughs> so right. if you can make it as a bartender, like you have some good multitasking skills and work ethic uh, and people skills, like you said. So, yeah, I mean, at that point, I was just like, what would have helped me a few years ago? Let me try to put that out into the Internet. You know, let me try to attract. So that video actually was I, I hadn't even seen it like in years, but that was the only one I did. I painted a wall green in my house. Or like some a part of a Walgreen right, 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 <laughs> and right. put up like two lights and recorded it and made it with iMovie and threw it up on a squeeze page, uh, put it on Twitter and ended up growing over the course of a couple of years, an international following of over 20,000 young moms in the club. Wow. So now interestingly, like my intention had been to turn this into a business. And uh, I don't know if you know who Simon Sinek is, but he's a really good speaker and author. I met him in New York actually when I went to this conference, but I went to him when I was struggling with Young Moms Club because I was like, I cannot ask these girls for money. Right. And I remember like having six dollars in my account and having to go to work. Right. And it's like, do I but I also need formula. But there's a way to monetize there's gotta be a way to monetize. Yeah. If you got twenty thousand people you might not need money from them, but exactly. you have exposure to them. Can you get an ad on your thing yep. or something like that? So how and that, you... so I was already like doing it, like not making money. And that's when I realized that eyeballs are currency online. Right, exactly. And so there's things that young moms are going to use, whether it's baby products or for themselves. And so I started learning how to like be like an influencer right? and getting some contracts and people would pay me or send me free products. I would vet it. Like I'm a... I do not promote Endure something, something I don't that like. you don't like. Yeah. But then you like Huggies and they're saying, hey, I'll give you, you know, $2,000 a month if you mention exactly. Huggies once every time you do a video. Yeah. So I kind of learned how to do that. And then, you know, I even I monetize the videos. They still make money um, like on from AdSense just right. existing in there because they're SEO'd really well. And then I was people started asking, how are you doing this? So that's when I started my marketing agency. And that's where my business is like helping people passion people who are like passionate and want to change the world right. and want visibility and make a difference. I started like reaching out and helping other solo entrepreneurs with their businesses. I think we have a photo oh. you could put up while she's, I mean, you're not going to, you can only see the videos. You don't get this, but oh, there it is. <laughs> this one? Yeah. Put that up. It's going to be right here between us. Okay. So yeah. And you know, so then I was like, okay, let me, 
and actually I was giving a bunch of advice for free and like live streaming and building an audience on like Periscope. Uh, Periscope became I a thing. Yeah, I saw that you had a lot of uh, mark, uh, helping people with Periscope. I just don't even know what that is. Periscope is it used to be owned by Twitter, but it was like it was the very first uh, broadcasting platform before Facebook Live, before any, before YouTube. Oh, would so it was like a YouTube broadcast. Facebook Live. So it was just one app, and of course, I always like download the like newer apps and just like try them out to see what it is. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in my car waiting to pick my kids up from school, and I pushed broadcast. And then I see people like talking. I'm like, can you see me right now? <laughs> and, then, and you were in. And then I like learned about it, made tutorials like how to use it and help people grow their business on Periscope. I grew like a big following there, was invited and hired to speak about it at different events like New York, San Francisco. I was on a panel, a panel with um, Winnie Cooper, Dan Danica McKellar. Yeah, Winnie. Yeah, so I'm like on a panel with her talking about how to use Periscope to get targeted followers. Um, she's really cool and brilliant and has a book about math. I, I've heard, yeah, she's, yeah. she's a math genius. She's yes. a math teacher. I mean, maybe she's not a uh -huh. public school teacher, but I know she loves math and she, I think she did what I'm currently doing, making all those two math yep. tutorial videos. I'll send you a picture of me and her. And just, yeah, it's pretty Winning. cool. Um, yeah, so she was, she was great. Anyway, so like then um, Periscope, that it just cost them a lot of money to like maintain. They'd stopped, you know, doing that. But I had built such a following there and with YouTube that I was teaching people now teaching people how to grow, like uh, grow their businesses online and how to take a brick and mortar online or how to promote yourself online. Um, and so I do a lot of like one-on-ones, like VIP days and events uh, where I help people build their funnels. And so it's like, there's a, on FordFunnels.com actually is the, the Ford Funnel system where it's like how to get exposure, how to set up a landing page, how to come up with an intro product, a core product, an upsell, you know. Right. Um, tar you know targeted marketing. And you never went to marketing. school for advertising, marketing, All business. I'll, I did, I, you know, bought a few courses here and there. And right, things. right, right, right. Yeah, but I never, like, went, went to school to, right, for Right, UNLV it. for advertising. Not even and, one single class. And that's, you know, and that's something very significant. You know, I'm big into academics. I'm, you're a trustee. Yeah. And, um, but not, college doesn't necessarily have to be the route. Right. You know, you have, and it's You really want your doctors hard. to go to college. Of course, you <laughs> want your pilots to go to college. Yeah. But at the same time, if you want to be a business owner or if you want to be, you know, you want to make a lot of money underwater welding, or if you want to, you know, yeah. be a YouTube star, you know, hopefully not just by, you know, right. looking stupid, but actually, <laughs> you know, having a product to offer, you know, school, just because you're smart doesn't mean you have to go to college. Go to college if it's a means to an end. Yeah, right. Absolutely. If you need to, people always ask me, would you go back to school? I'm like, if I had to, like whatever right. I do in two years or five, I don't know what I'm going to be doing then. If right. I need to go to school, I'll go to school. Maybe you will. Right. We'll see. Yeah. Right, but you don't have to go to school for business to open a business. Correct. It teaches you how to run someone else's business. Right. Now, if you want to become a teacher, you've got to have a degree in order to get licensed. So you would have to go to school. Absolutely. If you want to be a pilot, mm -hmm. you have to get licensed. But actually, you probably could just go to pilot school instead of university. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, and did we get to see both of our little pictures of our two little businesses? All right. And then you decided that you wanted to uh, run for politics. <laughs> yeah. So then it was, you know, back to like getting diagnosed with ADHD and realizing like, first of all. This is before you thought about trustee or anything. Correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was really involved with the kids' school. You know, I was like on the PTO. I was... Cub Scout leader, you know, doing all these things. I had a lot of questions about money. You know, I'm going like, why can't we? Like I started a snack shack and then I was like, let's try to, you know, partner with some farmer's markets or these home kitchens and see if we can do all this. And they're like, no, all you can do is, you know, Cheetos brand because we have a contract. And I'm like, who decides the contracts? Right, you know? right. That's crazy. And then the rules, it's because of like the sugar content. Well, this much Cheetos is okay, but an apple is way too much sugar. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, so you started getting into workings of contracts and who gets yeah. those contracts. And, and I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I have questions. So I can only promise you guys like to ask the questions and to share what I find out, but I'm not an expert in education. I think I'm going to just go ahead and run for this and put my name in. And I really had the, the faith and actually I was going off my intuition, just like telling me like you should run for trustee. And then I'm like, but why intuition? And then- uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have conversations with your intuition? <laughs> yeah, I do, many of them. Many of them. <laughs> Is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> it's nothing, it's the source. No, it's, source. it's luckily. It's God, <laughs> it's God, but I'm not religious, you know? And so, um, <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Okay, yeah. we'll talk about that. Yeah, I don't even have that written down yet. <laughs> Let's talk about religion. Yeah, um, I could go there. 
No, so, and then, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm following it. Then I was like, I think I can just do it. I didn't really raise that much money. All the money I raised went to signs. I did like, right. and that was in the general election. I actually won the primary with $1,500. Right. All right, uh, you got a video ready for us? Oh. We got a video of you after you had won the primary and preparing for the general election. Yep. That's uh, another walk through the timeline of Daniel Ford. Okay. This is Danielle Ford and I want to personally thank you for helping me win the primary election and beating out a field of nine candidates. I was never the establishment's pick. However, with your support, we were able to make it this far. But now I need your help once more to make sure that we have representation for students, families, teachers, and support staff on that school board. And I need your help by voting for me in the general election on November 6th. Let's work together to make sure that our children get the quality education that they deserve. As a single mom of two CCSC students, I have been very involved in their education over the past decade. Our family went from struggling just to make ends meet to growing a successful business, all while volunteering in classrooms, serving on the PTO, and leading Cub Scouts. I am the only candidate in this race who even has any children and who gets it when it comes to understanding the real life struggles of families and what it's like to be genuinely concerned about our children and their future. With your help, I pledge to advocate passionately for our children and toward the goals that benefit all of us. So please, on November 6th, cast your vote for me for school board trustee of District F. You can learn more about my stances at votedanielleford.com. Aww. <laughs> this is like, I have not watched this episode. A little so long. walk it's down memory good. lane. Yeah, it is that. <laughs> well, you know, that's the coverage you only get from the Johnny Bruce show. I like it. Thank you. Um, so, you know, like I said, that doesn't look like it was produced by a political pack. I did that myself. Yeah. I did it, it in like iMovie. Your daughter's <laughs> holding a thing, yeah. you're doing your uh, little thing. And now you're in the big leagues. Now all of a sudden you won your primary. People know you're not an establishment candidate. Uh, would you classify yourself as a Democrat or a Republican or anything like that at that time? No. Well, <laughs> I don't like any part. I, I don't believe in a two-party system, quite frankly. And I don't believe in, like, joining things where you're expected to believe a certain thing. And the whole thing. And all of it. Right. Including libertarian and independent. You know, so I'm nonpartisan. Like, literally registered nonpartisan. Right, not independent. Not independent, not libertarian, not whatever party, like no party. Right. Like sometimes when I talk to Republicans, they're like, I feel like you're a Republican. Right. <laughs> and when I talk to Democrats, they're like, really? Because you totally align with right. all the Democrats. Well, like, what's your favorite, say, uh, conservative stance? Um, probably, I, see, I just don't like because it's so black and white, but I would say I'm closer to the minimum wage huh. thing. Like, I don't. What, so we, more capitalism. I would say, like, I believe there's a place for it, and like, I believe that it's okay to make a ton of money, you know. But at the same time, like, I don't know that I want my kids coming out of the gate making fifteen dollars an hour. Like, I kind of want them right. to. Or your kids can't get a job. If right. it's fifteen dollars an hour, we're going to hire an adult. You know, why would we hire a seventeen-year-old kid? You said you worked at that uniform factory. Right. I mean, uh, could they yes, pay you fifteen dollars an hour? Absolutely not. And yeah. I have, you know, been able to using minimum wage, help a lot of people launch their careers, young mothers. Entering the workforce at nine, ten dollars uh -huh. an hour. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, but at the same time, there's people that take advantage of it. At the same time, I just feel like if we had better training for everybody, there would be nobody that, you know, like there'd be a place for everybody. If we and offered training, then there'd be somewhere to give you a job at that level. So I'm guessing that might be your progressive stance. So you're yes. you're conservative regarding free market capitalism, keep the minimum wage low so people can enter the workforce. But then from your progressive side, we need to offer more training, more schooling, free. more like for, yes. Okay, well it's free. Look, teachers <laughs> should be it should be free to become a teacher. If it's free to become a police officer and a firefighter, right. It should be free to be a teacher, and that you sh that's the, let's just start there. Right, every <laughs> single teacher has yeah. tons of student debt, and when you're making forty thousand dollars a year, even if your student debt is as low as fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, how are you ever going to pay that back? And so it's so much like this, these conversations are like, should education be free or not? It's like I don't know. There's probably some middle grounds, and there's probably a way to like. Well, and that's one it, of the things with know? our political discourse nowadays is everything's so black and white when everything 
falls in the gray area. Yes. I mean, everything. I mean, January 6th wasn't an armed insurrection, but at the same time, it wasn't a picnic. You know, there's an in-between to every, you know, coronavirus. It does exist. Is it the Black Plague? No, it's somewhere in between. How was it yeah. made? There's probably something sketchy going on there at the same time. That's none of my business. It's here. How do we handle it? Like, what are the facts? You right. know? Right. There's, it is very, everything is very gray. But. And, but that's so grounded because, you know, like, especially being that now that you're a trustee and you're working, and it seems like there's a lot of political factions pulling you in different directions when really you're trying to have a, a common sense approach. Yeah, or, you know, sometimes an approach might be the best for this moment and not the best forever. Right. Or maybe it's good for the, this these people or this way of doing things, and you might be right in saying that this works, but at this moment where we are and where we have to go, maybe we got to do something different. Like, I don't know. There's no right. way to say what is right. Right. I mean, time. for me, common sense and logic leads me to pretty conservatism. But at the same time, I believe in decriminalization of drugs. I believe in emptying mm -hmm. the jails. I believe yep. in, you know, certain things, that, you know, that would be considered progressive, but I just feel like that's also common sense, you know. But it's not. Like, there's a lot of people that would argue with you and say, like, you are not a conservative. If right. You believe well, that. you know, for example, I listen to Charlie Kirk. Do you know Charlie Kirk? I know the name of the He's a conservative uh, podcast. He's part of the, um, um, what am I trying to think of? The, um, oh, it's a, it's a conservative um, participation thing for high school kids because there's so many progressive groups and clubs that are in high schools that it's a conservative I, turning point USA. Okay. And he goes around and he goes to colleges to speak to colleges, but also they start like what used to be maybe the Young Republicans Club. Gotcha. Now mm -hmm. would be a turning point chapter. That's cool. <clears throat> but, you know, he's staunchly against the legalization of marijuana, and, you know, certain things that I don't necessarily agree with. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they'll tell you. I'm very, very conservative in most aspects of my life. And I feel like that's common sense. But like you said, yeah. you know, I don't consider it free training. I consider it government sponsored, taxpayer funded. Training. Oh, absolutely. I, but yes, but then do we, I want to use my tax dollars for that. Right. So that's what I want to do. Right. <laughs> you know. And, you know, and then, but sometimes I hear people, I had um, a conversation, for lack of a better term, on Facebook where, you know, the people are saying they want to return on their investment. So they want, you know, free schools, free daycare. And I, I explained to people, you know, it's not, your taxes aren't an investment. Your taxes are supposed to just build the roads, just keep the country going. But otherwise, we should be free and you should you know, you want to go to school, great, you could go to school, you know, we supply K through 12. And then after that, you know, you get the return on investment when you are 70 years old, and the people making the decisions for you are educated, or the people driving the car next to you got good free, free driver's ed training, you know, and they're not or your kid is, you know, working as the CEO of something. And now someone else who didn't get the social emotional help in school goes in and shoots up their business. There's your return on investment. A happier, healthier, calm uh, society. I I like everything you just said, except for return on investment, because taxes are not supposed to be a return on investment. But you still but all value. your ideas. There's your value. We're trying to improve society. Yeah. We're not trying to um, prop people up. We're not trying to hand things out. We're not trying to give away free stuff. We're trying to improve our society. Here's a business approach that I agree with that this actually so anybody who's conservative or you know has a business knows that sometimes you charge for the value of something and not for how long it took you to do so if i charge <clears> someone two thousand dollars for i actually charge seven hundred dollars an hour to get, pick my brain right. okay people pay it or two thousand dollars to work with me for a full day um well I'm not charging you twelve dollars an hour. You're right. paying for the value your education, that you get. your experience, so your sometimes results. It's like, what would be the value of investing all of our money right now, the long term? You know, so you can't really tell me that you don't want to spend your money now because you can't see an immediate return on investment while also right. charging other people thousands of dollars for your one hour, right? Because they get a value from it. So it's really you have to look at it like that, and it's worth the investment for. All, all of our kids to be able to be successful later. Um, and then before you actually got elected, I think it was between the time you won the primary and the other time, you uh, started going on, you started making news 
we started going on local news and stuff like that, and you got the picture of uh, Danielle Ford being too sexy for a political position. There you go, too sexy for the school board. Yeah, that was interesting. Did you like that or not like that? Look, I, I got a call. I think I would like it, but I'm not <laughs> sexy, so if somebody called me sexy, I might, you know, be like, yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it's like, fine, call me sexy, whatever, but not really when I'm running for something and I want to get elected and make a difference. Well, you've been trying like, to be sexy for eight years and nobody yeah, noticed. Can, now you're trying to be right. a professional and they're calling you sexy. I'm like, come on, guys. You know, I got a call and it was like, hey, we saw that you won the primary. You know, you crushed all these establishment candidates. Like, can we do an interview yeah, with you? Yeah, I saw you beat one of my my friends, uh, Mike Thomas. Do you know oh, Mike Thomas? Oh, I know Thomas? Mike. I, I liked Mike. Oh, you know, I like Mike cool. a lot. I, but, and cool. I, when I was doing my research, I'm like, oh, Mike ran for that. Holy cow, you know? And so I'm like, I'm like, that. there's a story, like, single mom wins primary. I'm right. like, sure, what's it about? Oh, Wait, how about looks and brains, <laughs> not uh, we too have, sexy? We have parents concerned that you're too sexy and that your messages are wrong for kids. I'm like, that's what your story is about? I'm like, I could give you a list if you want to do a story on something corrupt. Right. Like, then I, then I was like not going to do it. I actually went on social media like, hey guys, I got this call. Should I do it or not? And then I was like, I don't. I'm going to do it because I don't want other people to tell the story. Right. You know, or she well, wouldn't. And, and then these people are trying to look for your PT's commercial. Yeah. And you, you know, right. I guess on Facebook or something. Do you got the picture? She put up some boudoir pictures, which I don't know. I remember like 10, 15 years ago. You know, I used to be a bartender and stuff. Like all the girls we're doing these boudoir pictures, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. First and so of all, that particular one is a good friend of mine's uh, photography studio, and I used to model for her all the time, so that, and she, like, even for conventions, so actually this is education-based, because she would have people come here during the photography convention, and they would learn from her, and she'd have a couple of us, like, modeling and teaching them how to do boudoir, boudoir photo shoots, so... First of all, I will do boudoir like all my life. I might go do it next weekend. Except I wasn't so busy with all this stuff. Like, right. And post them online, okay? Until I don't feel like doing it anymore. Whatever, that would be in a bikini. That's art. Right. I'm promoting my friend's business. I'm happy. Like, the problem you is people sexualizing art? everything or making it wrong to feel sexual. Right. Which leads right into like all the, you know, too sexy for the school board because the video was how to be sexy right. that they were but, upset about. And then the other question is, you know, what if you were a six and you had these pictures? Yeah, then would, would that be care? okay? Or then would it be bullying? Well, I'm right. Like, I'm just, right. So, yeah. I mean, if you're good looking and you do these pictures, you're too sexy. Right. If you're not attractive and you're doing these pictures, you know, they would probably have something bad to say about that. Like, you know, what, you know like no matter what, hate is going to hate. Yeah, so I mean, it is actually bullying to say to criticize my photos, but not someone else's, or for a different reason. You know, what right. I mean? like leave me alone. Right. Or if there's a picture of me flexing on the beach in my yeah, speedo. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> who you does know, you I think felt he good. is? I'm trying to show some girls that I got some muscles and. Or yeah, or just put it out there. It's a whole self-esteem thing. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Putting yourself out there for one thing make, helps you do the next thing. So you could there's a. There's an argument to be made that that is part of what helped me get elected because I could take the criticism because I right. am comfortable. And with all due respect, you probably get some attention. Yeah, and I mean, like it's just whatever. Like it's no one's business. But to be a news story is crazy. reaching. It's reaching. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, because there's a lot of other things that we could talk. I mean, why aren't they talking about you helping teen moms? And it's not like this was on my campaign website. <laughs> Right, you had to find it. Yeah, and, and I posted it publicly. They found it from my archives. <laughs> so it's not like I was trying to hide it either. Right, right, right. It wasn't on like, like some oh. OnlyFans. Have you yeah. heard about all these yeah. teachers getting in trouble? How do you feel about that? How do you feel if a teacher who's making freaking $42,000 a year or something is on the running a side hustle making $75,000 a year showing a little nipple or not even. Some of them aren't even. They're just dressing up in bikinis or uh, lingerie, and they're losing their jobs and stuff like that. I have not heard about that, oh, and it I've definitely hasn't once. been here. And if that was to happen, I would not support teachers losing their jobs for that. Unless they were, like, marketing to their students Right, or which, something. Which in the ones that I've been following recently, um, it was literally a secret. Like the yeah. only time she got caught is because she had broken up with her husband or boyfriend. Oh, and nope. then mm. he, he got should in get touch in trouble. with the school board yeah. saying, hey, or the administrators and saying, hey, this is my ex-wife. You know, she's doing this, you know, only So fans. what? So what? What if she's cocktailing in lingerie or working at the pool? 
on a Sunday or something. You know what I mean? Like, right. Who cares? Pay your teachers better and they won't have to do that. Now you're talking. Yeah. You know, and there's another thing. Or know, I, even if they want to just for fun, leave them alone. They're not, they're not going after your kids or right. whatever. Exactly. I mean, literally, because the only fan, it's not even like she was doing it on Facebook. It's an only fan. Yeah. Like, I don't know how that works, but I think you like got to pay to get access to those certain pictures and stuff like that. That's why it's kind of exclusive. I don't know how it works. Whatever. From what I understand, <clears throat> when you become a teacher, there's no oath that you take to never take a side job or to always be this in your personal life. Right. Whether it's supporting or defending or... I bet you a lot of teachers are working industry and dancing, and of course they're not telling anybody, but yeah. they have every right well, to be. And then we get into other things such as, you know, if somebody is on Facebook and they're a teacher and they don't support LBGTQ, or they do support it, or they love Trump, or they hate Trump, or, you know, they, you know, whatever the case may be, everybody, like we're talking about, has so many varying opinions on so many different social things, and like you said, if you're a part of the progressive, you got to be all in, you got to be against Israel, pro-Palestine, pro-LGBT, you got to be pro, uh, you know, legalization, you, you got to be all in, because once you say something, like, oh, I'm for everything, yeah. but I defend Israel. You're out. I'm yeah. for everything, but I just think there shouldn't be uh, transgender people doing story time to four-year-olds. You're out. You know, you have to be all in or you get, you know, the mark on your face, the scarlet letter or whatever that may be. I, I support mean, the, like, I believe, oh, see, I, if a teacher was on Facebook being like, math is the worst, why are you learning math? You know, like... You can't do that. Like, you're a teacher. You can't go criticize math, okay? Yeah, but, so, uh, but what would be the repercussions? Well, I don't know. But that's, like, something that I think would be warranted to be, like, why are you over here? Your kids might see you. You're putting it in their mind, like, they shouldn't care about math. Like, to relate that to, it should be anything that, like, direct, or, like directly affects students. So I would say that things like uh, talking bad about uh, transgender people when our, we know a lot of our students are. Right. Shouldn't be. You know, if you want to talk about Trump in general, Well, you fine. know, what if a teacher said, I want, I wish somebody would put a bullet in Trump's head? Um, I mean, that's kind of on the... That's one of those things where it's like, if you're a principal, that would be more about, like, the aggression, honestly. Yeah. Like, we don't teach kids... They can't say that in school. You know what I mean? Like, the, you can't say that about another student. Right. So whether it's Trump or someone else or the person at the grocery store that you're that talking about. But does that your purview or the school? I think it does follow somewhere in there and it should be more clear so that these things don't happen. But yeah, like any behavior that would be like get a kid expelled or whatever, teachers shouldn't be doing it either. Even if it's on their personal Facebook and they don't have students as their friends maybe like if they had a super secret one and it was no way to like if it was an only fans and they said that it'd be like whatever right, right you know but if it's like they have students on there it is their it's not private you know it's easy to find i would say that that's not okay but the problem is there's no good social media policies yet it's just everyone's like left suit on their own like common sense and unfortunately we know that there's a lack of that right now. Yeah, you ain't from both sides, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, from all sides. <clears throat> um, and then now you're in politics. What what does that mean? I mean, like, you, like I'm sure there were a bunch of things that you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting this or that or the other thing. So just in your first three months after getting elected, what were the biggest shockers to you? Honestly, right after getting elected, just learning, like, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I had I had some controversy like right off the bat because um, some decisions were made that the board wasn't included on that are like multi-million decision dollar decisions that we should be. And I guess my first woe was that the trustees didn't have the voice that the people voted or expected them to have when they voted for them, and the promises that they made were not able to fulfill because all districts are self-governing. And this is a great thing, actually, because it's in the Constitution. It was the founders. It was like Jefferson who wanted, who said, we want school boards to be local. We want them to stay local. We right. don't want them to be appointed. Right. Yeah, which will protect from whatever president or federal administration is going on. So it's great in theory. However, that's not actually working in practicality because the same people that you know would be appointing are buying out school board elections telling the trustees what to do, and the trustees are signing away their power. Yeah, the and that's something we were about to get into is, you know, it seems like the trustees are consistently giving away their power, yes. and it doesn't, it sounds, you know, self-defeating, but, I mean, whether you're at the end of a, 
what is the term limits? Three terms or two terms? Three terms. So if you're at the end of a three-term limit, I'm sure you could be bought off in one way, shape, or form, whether it's a job offer or... or new, because we're going to help you get elected. We just have, we want to make sure that you... Uh, vote on this person to come, you know, this is our guy. Can you, or girl, can you bring him here? Can you hire him? Don't question him, sign over your authority to this. Um, and anything else that you're gonna vote on, come ask us first what, what we want you to do. So all this questions you have are is, is making you popular, I'm guessing. Oh my God, <laughs> no, well, with some, but definitely not in the inner circles of politics. And uh, I mean, a lot of things like, for instance, um, the, we do, we work at the commission a lot. You know, we have the same attorney actually as a commissioners. And immediately right out the gate, the commissioners wanted us to do the open doors, open schools program, which I want to do. Um, sounds good in theory. And it's where we let the community use our schools on the nights and weekends. Right. Okay. Which I think is great. Yeah, like that in the perfect ideal world where there's like roses and... Well, when I was yes. a kid in, in New York, you know, like every Tuesday and Thursday night we had open gym at one middle school. We'd all go there and play like 40 of us. Was there staff there? Uh, there was like one dude there, like a janitor. Okay. But, you know, that was also in the 90s. There wasn't so much liability and everything else. Like if I turned my ankle, which I did... I wasn't getting a lawyer and suing the school because I turned my eye. I went right. home, put ice on it, yeah. and I came back two days later to play again. And then Mondays and Wednesdays, we'd go to another place. And it was just better to play indoors, whether it's winter or summer or raining. Or, or even outdoors, like the outside. They wanted the... They want the community to be able to use like the football fields and right. the playgrounds. Like, okay. So. I grew up here with my son. And we couldn't find a baseball field for me to hit some grounders to him. I mean, there were plenty of them that we drive by, but mm -hmm. all the gates are locked and it's a Saturday afternoon, beautiful day in Las and you're, Vegas. Well, going about these schools that are closed, like mm -hmm. I totally right. get and, that. And you would have to climb an eight foot fence in order to use it, which we did. Don't yeah. tell the trustees. And people do still. But now they're doing that and they're leaving trash or the homeless people go lay there or there's uh, broken glass and bottles or there's no cameras or there's no bathrooms or there's no water. And so it's like, yeah, I want to help. I want to do this, but we need we need to know what the budget is. We want to know. Does it, so the principal was going to have to go open the gate every Saturday and Sunday and every day on summer and spring break and then close it at well, night. When I was a kid, we didn't have gates you know it was just open you wanted to go play basketball you walked up you shot some hoops and you went home I... kind of me too i used to ride my bike around town and it's but now we know that people do in this city with our 376 plus schools go you know climb the fence and then destroy the field or vandalize the property or god forbid you know not to fear monger or whatever but what if they stored a weapon there you know type thing like right right so it's like yeah i want to there's so many things where it's like i want to do it but there's been there's no plan well i also did bad things too i mean you know the first time i got drunk was on a school property you know i mean i was like 12 yeah. years old and i didn't realize how strong whiskey was <laughs> okay. so I, you know, I took a i think my uh, grandfather would give me a sip of beer all the time and it's I, not the same. And I never caught a buzz. <laughs> so then my friend stole a bottle of whiskey, and I said, oh, well, I'm going to take more than a sip or two, like I did with the beer. So I took like six or seven or eight big sips. That's, yeah, nope, you're done. Yeah, it didn't work <laughs> out too well. But that was, also, you know, we climb up on the roof and stuff. Like, and you're right. I mean, I could have killed myself. I could have fell off the roof because... I'm like skimming up a pole or something. You know, I'm not walking up a ladder. I'm finding ways to be a ninja and get up to the school roof. But it's like, do we really want kids doing that right now? No. Right, but, but I don't we understand what's support them. different. You, you know what I mean? Like, things are just so different. We didn't I hate have the new. school shootings the way we do. And again, that's not, you know, Right, longer, but yeah, but, but Columbine kind of broke the it ice did. with that. I mean, we didn't have student suicides the way we did. You know, what if someone climbs up to the roof and does yeah, something else? I remember else, you know, student like, suicides when I was a kid. I don't know. I remember I, I picked kid. up my uh, my first girlfriend. I remember we uh, went and picked her up, and there was a dude hanging from the backstop. He hung himself at the end of school one day. And it was like, wow. you know, but, and mm -hmm. more than that, you know, but I also went to a really big high school. You know, I had a couple of friends get shot and stuff like that. And it wasn't like I grew up in a real violent part of town, but we had so many kids and, you know, suicides and shootings and kids making bad decisions you know i guess that happens right well we're also like super overcrowded it's like we already our schools don't have enough money and then if even <clears> if they ruin something <throat> there's no money for it so my whole thing was like everyone was mad at me for saying no to it but i'm like is the commission going to give us money like you know who's going to pay for this or the trash can that gets lit on fire or something the principal is that going to be instead of buying a computer you buy a trash can like 
just better answers. And so the whole thing is like when you say no to something or you don't just go along with what was predetermined by someone else, they all hate you. So I don't right. know how many politicians besides, like, actually support me, like, honestly. I, I think a lot of teachers and parents do. Right. But I don't know that I'm getting any Christmas invitation, Christmas party invitations. From the Republican or Democratic <laughs> Party? By any of them. <laughs> any of them. And with education, it, it truly is nonpartisan in the sense that the people that benefit from the curriculum, these large contracts and these national orgs are, it's the party, there's no party line. Like, there are Democrats and Republicans, and they have their, they're like working together to keep the machine going. Right. So even if I say this person is doing this and he's a Republican, or this person is and it's, you know, Democrat, like it has nothing to do with the parties. It's just like the rich, right. honestly. And it's, you know, a group of people who don't want to see the way that we do things ruined because they're going to be super sad that the communities are coming in and solving the problems and no one's buying their. Right. Anymore. Well, you brought up two points that we don't even have on our list. So let me just ask you really <laughs> quick. First of all, my question is this. We have overcrowded schools, right? Every class is, you know, 40, 45 when it should be 30 Some or 35. Some are 60. Well, yeah. That's disgusting. But nonetheless, you look at a 40 to 45 on average when it should be 30 to 35 on average. Mm -hmm. And then... We're talking about school choice. We're talking about count day. We're talking about all these things. Why does it seem like CCSD is so hungry? I mean, I know why they're so hungry for a large count day because that means more money. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if 10% of the students left and went to charter or private schools, which reduced you from 40 to 36 or whatever the case may be, and reduced the student population overall by 10,000 or 8,000 kids, making it more manageable, wouldn't that be better for everybody? I mean... In a sense, but it would be better if we just had more schools and well-funded because, you know, if count day happens and 10% are gone, well, now that school has to cut teachers. But well, then you're back to 44 kids. And exactly. That doesn't make sense. I mean, you should. I'm guessing a school is built for 1,000 kids. And it's got, you know, 100 mm -hmm. classrooms. So that sure. way, you know, whatever. I know what you're saying, yeah. Right. And that's all set up. All right. Now we got, a, you know, now we got 1,100 kids. Well, let's, you know, 100 of them are going to go to charter school or private school or home school. And now we're back to 1,000. Why is there now not enough money for that school I'll tell you why. when they have exactly the number of kids they're supposed to have? Because now we're in August or September, whenever the count day happens, but principal budgets are due in June to the state, and the principal has to try to predict how many are going to go to homeschool and private and charter. Right. That's fine. Get your education, you know? But they're going, I think we're going to have this much. We're still over capacity. We're... Rancho has 2,400 kids that is on a school that's set to fit like 1,800 or 1,600, okay? So there were over capacity. But meanwhile, I mean, this they many can't teachers, function with only 1,800 fi financially. They could, but if they plan for this much and then 100 leave, you know, that's 100 times 6,000. Well, now they're cutting teachers, we're Why cutting teachers? bus drivers. You know, when they, we used to put our budgets up to a vote in New York. And what they would do is they would punish the voters. If you didn't vote for the school budget in New York, the first thing to go was the buses. Why? Because then parents would have to drive their kids to school. They'd be inconvenienced, and that would motivate them to approve the budget instead of getting rid of you know, um, curriculum writers or, you know, you know, you got four school secretaries, get rid of a secretary instead of a teacher, but they wouldn't do that. They would get rid of the buses or the football team in order to most negatively affect the people who are voting on it. Why would the first thing to go be a teacher? Why wouldn't the first thing to go be a curriculum writer on Flamingo? Well, because it just goes by how many students we have left, you know, and then if we have to move them around or whatever, like now we have, okay, let's say all these kids, you planned out classes, you did this, and the kids that left were all theater kids. Right. And we had two theater, whatever. Well, now we don't need one of the teachers. Like, that's just, I'm not saying, like, that's always the first thing to go, but that's kind of, like, what ends up happening in the shuffle. Why? Because we can't keep the money for our teachers. Like, we have to tell the state, I need this much money for teachers, and they give right. that much money, and then you have to give it back. And But there's a, even another point, which you're not the trustee of private schools or charter schools, but... I've even spoken with directors of charter schools, and they say, we keep getting this grant money. Grant money for COVID was uh -huh. grant money for the football yeah. team, grant money for this or that, or ELL, or psychologists, or anything. 
But then he says, you know, I want to get, you know, I have 54 teachers. Can I get $54,000 and give the teachers a $1,000 raise each? But you can't. You can't. Because you have, because it's this, I agree. It's stupid. It needs to not work like this. But the principal has to predict how much money they need for teachers. And it can't be bonuses. And it can't be any of that. And then if they're wrong, they have to like scurry at the beginning of school. And everybody loses. And then if they figured out the bus routes, but now half of those kids on the bus just got messed up. And now they have to recalibrate everything. So it's the state. But it's also. And so, yes, we do want that It's that the bureaucratic money. system, and that's what I hate about progressivism, is that we need less regulation. Hey, you want to give a school $100,000? Thank you very much. I think we just need tighter regulation, because I can tell you right now, <laughs> oh we God. waste money, but we still don't have enough money. It's both. That's my point. Yeah. That's why I think we need less regulation, because, like I said, a couple of charter schools are sitting there, and they're getting this money and they have two hundred thousand dollars and they're trying to just like you guys right now you, you're getting all this too. money to money. wonder what to do with that money but meanwhile the teachers are begging for more money you guys want better teachers mm -hmm. but you can now you got I forgot it was some crazy number 80 million dollars or something that you got to decide how to spend oh no 800 million <laughs> like it's like it's a lot of money yeah right why can't we that 800 million first of all you could put that into a bond so that way you can make money off the interest and you could give every teacher a raise and use that money as principal to continuously give these teachers more to money back without in. losing a cent. And you guys don't know where to spend the money, so why not invest it in your human resources? I'll tell you that, I will tell you this, this is, we discuss these in closed sessions, so I can't give you details, but right. I will tell you that there are several trustees who want, who would love to use that money to go straight to our employees, not just teachers, but you know, admins, right, right. nurses, staff, bus everybody. drivers. We would love to, but uh, the current uh, leadership, um, everybody who's in those conversations is adamant about not doing it because it's not fiscally responsible because we're, you know, raising how much money we spend each year and then that's not replenishable. How does... So we have three years to spend that money, by the way. Right. And, and we need to take a break. We're already over of part one and we're going to get back. <laughs> but my last question of part one is, uh, what was I going to say? You distracted me. Sorry. And I'm only blaming you because I distracted myself <laughs> because I knew we were time over. Because you have six foot ADHD and I have seven foot ADHD. Exactly. That's <laughs> exactly right. What were we just talking about? Because it was a really good question. Um, let's see. It's going reverse. There was the money, the, the teachers, teachers paying the raise, the bonds. Um, how come? Oh, there we go. So <laughs> the teachers union, I don't care if you're talking about CCEA, NEA, the American Federation for Teachers, AFT. They are the strongest, most politically influential unions in the country, mm -hmm. probably in the world. They give more money to politicians than any other union in the world. You can go get a job holding a drive slow sign and make $120,000 a year thanks to the Teamsters. You could drive a 18 wheeler and make $120,000 thanks to their union. Why do the teachers have the strongest union and the absolute worst health care and the worst salaries? That's quite. It doesn't. That I have been trying to figure that out, but the current teachers union that we have right now is disaffiliated from National. Right, the CCEA, of course. Yeah, and so I. I'm trying, you know what, if somebody but can prove, old. hold on, hold on, if somebody can prove to me that the current leader of the teachers union didn't come here to completely screw teachers over, I let mean, me let me see that evidence. And teachers, what about students? I feel well, like students are getting screwed even more than teachers who are getting screwed. Absolutely, it trickles down. You need to be the like happy, healthy, educate, smart teacher showing up, caring right. for your students. Not an $80,000 curriculum writer on Flamingo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Which, thank you. Or, right. or... How about like a $30 million software th that we program. pay every program? When you had somebody in 2012 okay. who was doing it for $55,000 okay. a year, basically okay. for free. And then he leaves and sells you the damn program. And then you guys only pay for <laughs> half the program, steal the program, use it the wrong way. So you 
gave away the guy who was doing it for free, then you paid a million dollars for the program, and then you renege on paying the second million dollars, try to pirate the program, get it wrong, and destroy all the work that they were trying to do, which would have helped your the program from five to sixth grade. The same you know program what I'm that about. the state loves, that other yeah. districts You're love. You're making me sweat, Dude. man. We're on the same page. I'm not going to say any specifics, but lawyer speak and stuff would be able to argue with you about that. I would not join their team, though. Right. Well, <laughs> Just that's what broken. I'm going to say. How about right that? Now. Yeah. All right, guys, we are getting back uh, to part two <laughs> in just a moment. We are going to be talking about colored people. Well, huh? well, you know, this, uh, is, this is my tease. You're that, not, that would go towards the CRT this is, topic. This maybe. is this is my part. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna be talking about. <laughs> go ahead, right? People ahead. of color. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Anti-racism, AB one sixty eight, where you can't suspend a student unless he shoots a teacher. We're gonna be talking about uh, dick measuring. Did I read that right? Why would we be talking about dick? Is measuring? it D I C K? Yes. Yeah, yes. Dick you, measuring. You're quoting me right. Dick measuring oh, contest. that was you. <laughs> all, right, all right. I haven't watched the video yet. Okay. Um, and we're going to be talking about the soap opera that, I mean, if you, once you hear all this, you're going to think, what a soap opera. And that's not even the half of it. We're going to get into the soap opera, the factions. You guys think the CCRP is divided as different factions? Same thing going on with the Democrats, the moderate Democrats, the Democrats, Socialists, and Henderson. Same thing going on with the establishment and the universe and the individual trustees. They're all picking teams. Uh, you guys all know who watched the show. Katie Williams uh, stood me up. We were going to talk to her about this. Danielle never stood me up. Thank you, Danielle. You're welcome. Um, you going to a school board meeting and speaking as a parent as opposed to a school board member. We're going to be talking about the new grading system where uh, <laughs> CRT and notice that's different from anti-racist policy. Yes. Of course, we're going to be talking about coronavirus, coronavirus restrictions. School is going to be starting. What do you guys as parents in Clark County need to know about any differences, distance learning, chances of a lockdown, masks, three feet, six feet, teachers, yada, 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 vaccines. And then we'll finish off with you guys who submitted your questions to Danielle Ford. If you didn't use any four letter words the way she does, then I'm apologize. going to be uh, asking her your question for you. So thank you so much for watching. Danielle Ford, we'll be right back. This portion was brought to you by Infinity, the Math Institute, where you don't get more math problems, you get solutions. 702-768-1777. We'll be right, well, for some of you, we'll be right back. For others of you, we'll be back tomorrow for part two on YouTube. <laughs> My name is John Brookhagen. This is The Johnny Brew Show.